if we give liver support, we can better metabolize our hormones. And so you're getting into the cytochrome P450 system where, you know, that's where we touched on briefly about estrogen hyperexcretion. So if you add cobalt, it slows down that cytochrome P450 metabolism and can lessen someone's dose. Whereas if they might have needed 30 milligrams of cortisol, now they can use 10 because their body is able to use, utilize it better. But in many people, if they take something like, you know, milk thistle, or they take phylanthus complex, or they're taking nutrients to support liver function, they have a lot better outcomes for hormonal deficiencies. So women who have terrible hot flashes with a glass of wine can take liver support and their liver tolerates and treats them better when they have more nutrients on board to, to get better, you know, phase one and phase two liver support. Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Mike Mutzel with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're live with Dr. Wendy Ellis, and we're going to learn all about female hormone imbalances and male hormonal imbalances. She's going to share with us some of the common endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment, how that affects our hormones, our neurotransmitters, chemistry. Then we're going to talk about mold and mycotoxicity. So Dr. Ellis is a naturopathic physician. She went to naturopathic medical school at National College of Naturopathic Medicine in Portland, Oregon, and she practices here at the Tahoma Clinic in Seattle, Washington. So Dr. Ellis, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm excited. So I think we met, I don't know, maybe back in 2011 or 2012, and you put on a fantastic conference, you know, all about helping women with, uh, you know, osteoporosis, osteopenia, you know, neurotransmitters, weight loss, and so forth. But can I share your journey? How did you get involved in naturopathic medicine and hormones? Um, well, I've, I've always been interested in medicine, so I always knew I'd be practicing some type of medicine, um, and I was going to be a DO, actually, and then my sister died of this horrible pulmonary embolism that went undiagnosed, so I felt like she didn't get adequate medical care. People didn't listen to her, so I moved to Seattle from Maine and started waiting tables and thought, ah, this isn't what I want. I need to get back into medicine, and through driving through Santa Cruz, someone said, why don't you be a naturopathic doctor? And so I had no idea what that was. And so I thought, yeah, I can practice medicine and I can do more preventive care. And so that's how it all began. Mm, fantastic. You ended up in a great spot with Jonathan Wright and the Tahoma Clinic and so forth. How did that kind of manifest? Um, so I was living in Portland, Oregon at, a, at the time and just needed something different. And one of my good girlfriends, Dr. Corin Barrett, who's in Orange County, she said, hey, why don't you go look into this practice they're hiring? So I put together this big fertility um, medicine packet and said, I want to bring fertility medicine to your clinic. And so I had a packet for all 10 people who were in the room and I got the job. So Fantastic. When I joined the practice. He's the father of bioidentical hormones. And so you learn about a lot about hormones. And I had the benefit of every patient I saw for the first year, I had to review every case with him. So I had this great mentor experience. And so I, I really have him to thank for being able to have such a great learning experience. If we could all have that, it would be great. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. What an opportunity. Uh, and before we dive into, you know, fertility and toxins and endocrine disrupting chemicals, mm -hmm. any clinical pearls that you can share from working with Jonathan Wright? Uh, I know he's a huge fan of 24 hour hormone testing, looking at metabolites. He has a lot of work with iodine. Like what are some of the pearls that we should know about that you've learned from him after uh, being mentored by him? You know, he, he's always back to nature, right? And so I got schooled by him yesterday a little bit for recommending a pharmaceutical, you know, medicine where he said, you need to rule out all these other things first. And so he, I mean, he goes off the beaten path and he looks into the heavy biochemistry like you do. Mm -hmm. um, so he focuses on how can we make a system within the endocrine system or within our GI symptom? What are the nutrients it needs to work and how can we support that system? And so I think he's constantly going into the micronutrients, for example, cobalt for helping process toxins in the liver and for helping us um, not excrete our hormones too readily or looking at iodine for estradiol and estrone conversion to estriol looking at, you know, B12 and folate as far as, you know, what are the most important nutrients? And so he really looks at biochemistry in, in 
in functionality of our of our whole entire body chemistry. So I think that he focuses on that, and he's always trying to pull us back into the most important biochemistry behind body physiology. Yeah, he's definitely ahead of the curve. I remember, you know, the cobalt thing, he was talking about that back in, I think, 2009. And he was, you know, promoting berberine long before, you know, now it's so popular now in 2015. I mean, everyone knows that berberine is great for blood sugar, but this was something that he was talking about in newsletters and seminars long ago. So yeah, he wrote for Prevention Magazine in the 70s. I mean, so he's been naturopathic before naturopathic medicine even became big. Right. That's amazing. Cool. Well, let's kind of transition a little bit now and talk maybe more about fertility, some clinical pros there and talk about applications of bioidentical hormones. And maybe I'll give you a little bit of context. We've had guests on the shows that are very pro hormone. We've had other guests in the shows, naturopathic doctors, your colleagues uh, that are not so much in hormones and really restoring, you know, gut health, getting after the adrenals and then maybe using a little bit of progesterone. So there's kind of two schools of thought. Where do you fit in and what sort of path? you know, do you recommend folks kind of start out with testing and so forth? Right. So, you know, a lot of people say, you know, replacing hormones in a postmenopausal woman is not natural. Um, but at the same time, we're having a huge influx of patients going into premature ovarian failure. Um, and that might be in their 20s or their 30s. We're seeing men who have testosterone levels of 70 year old men, even though they're 25 or 30. And so, you know, we're not living in a natural world. And so sort of the natural process of hormones declining is accelerated because of that. So it's, it's interesting to me because you have a lot of doctors who will consider giving thyroid hormone replacement, but they won't consider giving estrogen. And so, uh, you know, just to talk with a patient today who said, you know, I'll never do estrogen. It's not natural. But yet she's not sleeping more than an hour or two at a time at nighttime. And it happened at menopause. And so you really have to work at the risk to benefit ratio of what you're doing. Um, and so you can start with botanicals. You can try to encourage an ovary to make more estrogen or progesterone with black cohosh or with Vitex. Um, but if you have a postmenopausal ovary, you can't stimulate the pituitary gland to make more hormone from that gland. So you you know every patient's different and so botanicals might work for one person but they might not work for another and you know in our practice we usually get people who have tried all these things already and they're ready for more aggressive treatment and so sometimes we start there sometimes we don't mm -hmm. when you say they've tried all these things we're talking black cohosh and different herbs and maybe topical progesterone is that what we're saying yeah, exactly. Or they might have tried, you know, eating clean, drinking water. They might try avoiding alcohol to decrease hot flashes. And we talk about all those things as well. You know, we're a naturopathic practice, so we do hit the lifestyle factors. But, you know, I think that the literature is changing on hormones. And really all the fingers are being pointed at progestin now, which is what's in Depo-Provera. It's what's in birth control pills. It's what a lot of women are giving to their kids at you know, 12 years old for hormonal dysfunction. And so really there's a lot more damage to be gained from progestin, whereas progesterone, there aren't enough clinical studies because you know, there's, there's not a lot of hormone studies that have been done on that because we were all using progestin for so many years. Mm. So Tori Hudson, um, she's been focusing a lot on if women have had hysterectomies and they need hormone replacement, to not give them progesterone because there just aren't enough studies to support that it's safe versus a lot of studies supporting that progestins are dangerous. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, the literature is constantly changing and it changes, you know, you can read five articles in support of one, you know, one hormone regimen being safe, and then you can find 10 articles saying the exact opposite. So you have to be careful with reading articles to know what's really true and what's being. So with studies, you have to be very careful because in many circumstances, they may be funded by certain groups that are, would benefit from the study or might not benefit from the study. And so, and also sometimes the summary of the study or the abstract might say one thing, but if you go and read the entire study, you might, have a different perspective on what the what that means. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, from the limited review that I've you know done in, in hormone studies and so forth, the title will say something in regards to estrogen or progesterone, but they're using progestins and so forth. And um, so it's you're kind of like, well, I mean, imagine if a nutritional study came out and it said, um, I don't know, uh, 5-MTHF is beneficial for depression. And then in the study, they actually materials and methods, they use folic acid. I mean, that would be totally ridiculed, but it seems to be accepted in hormone literature. Exactly. Progestin, progestogens, progesterone. Exactly. But I'd say the Europeans, you know, the Europeans are far more apt to use bioidentical estradiol versus, you know, an oral micronized progesterone. Transdermal estrogen and oral progesterone as compared to we tend to use. Even now, people get Premarin prescribed to them all the time. They are given oral oral estrogen a lot. And if we go back to the Women's Health Initiative studies, women were dying of strokes and they were dying of breast cancer. So bioidentical or not, if you swallow estrogen in an oral microdiet, you know, in an oral pill, like an orthotricycline pill, or even straight estradiol, if you swallow it, it does increase stroke risk. Versus mm -hmm. transdermal can have an increased cardiovascular risk, but not even near the, the comparative, you know, studies. You know, oral oral is always worse than transdermal as far as estrogen goes. Mm -hmm. Oral Estrone does not carry that same risk. Do you want to kind of expand on that? I think it has to do with different you know, liver detoxification pathways and different metabolites that are converted there. Do you have anything further to add to that? Sure. So when you're swallowing something, it has two passes through the liver. And generally speaking, when we see oral estrogen, it increases the C-reactive protein. And so anything that increases the C-reactive protein is considered inflammatory. And it's considered the C-reactive protein isn't specific to cardiovascular health, but we correlate it with cardiovascular health. And so anything that increases an inflammatory blood marker, we want to avoid. Mm -hmm. So oral progesterone, you know, the problem with oral progesterone is that it doesn't always give adequate uterine protection. So you could take 100 milligrams orally, the liver's passing through it twice, it's conjugating it, excreting it out the kidneys. And so there are progesterone receptors on the bone, on the brain, on the lungs, in many different places on the skin. And so you can't always ensure that you're getting enough uterine protection. So you might have a thickened uterine lining and you might tend towards postmenopausal bleeding. So every time I'm using oral progesterone in a, in a woman with a uterus, I'm always combining it with some cream of progesterone vaginally to make sure I'm protecting her uterine lining. Interesting. But oral progesterone, one of the benefits, and this gets into the neuroendocrine system a bit, is that it stimulates the GABA receptors and, you know, it has this anxiolytic, anti-anxiety um, benefit. And so many people have an improved mood, um, they feel less anxious, they get better sleep. And so we do use oral progesterone. We really try to stay away from some, even sublingual estrogen and oral estrogen. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Let's talk about dosing on the oral progesterone. What it, obviously, you do a lot of testing, which I think we'll talk about, but if you could kind of give us ballpark ranges that you find to be most effective in majority of your patients. Yeah. Um, so the problem is that if I just go to a pharmacy, like a Walgreens or Bartels, they have 100s and 200s. That's it. Um, and so you're really limited by what you can get at the pharmacy. So that's why we use, we use compounding pharmacies, because for the sleep component, Many people do well on 25 to 50 milligrams of oral progesterone, but you know at the same time, 100 milligrams. If I'm, I, I might start with someone's regular pharmacy because insurance covers it. But the problem with too much progesterone is they can feel depressed, puffy, bloated. They feel kind of hungover the next morning, and so that's when we move to a compounding pharmacy. Mm, lower doses. Um, what about for men? For let's say they have anxiety and sleep issues and so forth. Have you found that oral progesterone is good for them as well? You know, I really don't use oral progesterone in men. I know there's a big push towards it, and a lot of doctors are starting to use that. Um, I might use pregnenolone which pregnenolone, if you look at the steroid hormone tree, pregnenolone is at the top and branches out to all the sex hormones. So it's a little bit of Russian roulette with pregnenolone because some men, if they have insulin resistance or they have a big belly around the middle, you can go into super supplements and pick up pregnenolone. You know, it's available over the counter. So in many circumstances, if they take, if a man with a big belly takes pregnenolone, he may convert that to estrogen. But 
if you don't have a big belly and you don't have a high, and it's called aromatization of, you know, estrogens to, or testosterone to estrogen or pregnenolone to estrogen, then, you know, in a, in a, Thin man with low cholesterol, low blood sugar, I might use pregnenolone, maybe 25 milligrams at night before bed under the tongue. And that can have the same anxiolytic, you know, side effects and the benefit of sleep and anxiety improvement as women. Mm. Fantastic. Cool. Now, we, you hit on uh, C-reactive protein and the link with oral estrogens and heart disease. And I know there's a huge link between you know, hormones in general and autoimmunity. We know that autoimmunity is pretty prevalent, much more so in women than men. So what have you found in terms of uh, modulating hormones, increasing detox pathways and hormone elimination and improvements uh, in reducing risk for autoimmunity? That's a big question. Um, so basically, when we think of autoimmune disease, you know, let's think about that as a whole. So we think about viral influences, we think about gastrointestinal influences, which, you know, we also think about liver function. We also think about um, the hormone influences. And actually, and I will get to the answer to your question, but the one thing about autoimmunity and hormones is that there's a lot of great research for DHEA. DHEA is one of those hormones that improves your more anti-inflammatory cytokines and sends your cytokines away from that pro-inflammatory cytokines. And there are a lot of articles on PubMed over the years that have been done with DHEA, mostly in a 200 milligram dose, which they named prasterone. Um, so if you're interested in looking these up, you can Google, you know, or go to PubMed, prasterone and MS or prasterone and, you know, lupus. But some hormones can be very inflammatory to autoimmune diseases. For example, estrogen and testosterone can be very inflammatory. And so if someone has autoimmune disease, even though autoimmunity can really have a prevalence for attacking our endocrine system, giving the hormone replacement can actually make their symptoms worse. Mm. So I do try to shy away from testosterone or estrogen in women who have lupus or Sjogren's syndrome or some of those more inflammatory sort of joint pain uh, autoimmune diseases because it can make it worse. But when it comes to liver function, a lot of what we find is that if we give liver support, we can better metabolize our hormones. And so you're getting into the cytochrome P450 system where, you know, that's where we touched on briefly about estrogen hyperexcretion. So if you add cobalt, it slows down that cytochrome P450 metabolism and can lessen someone's dose. Whereas if they might've needed 30 milligrams of cortisol, now they can use 10 because their body is able to use, utilize it better. But in many people, if they take something like you know, milk thistle, or they take phylanthus complex, or they're taking nutrients to support liver function, they have a lot better outcomes for hormonal deficiencies. So women who have terrible hot flashes with a glass of wine can take liver support and their liver tolerates and treats them better when they have more nutrients on board to, to get better, you know, phase one and phase two liver support. Mm. That's that's amazing. So does cobalt also help with aromatase? We, you kind of hit on that, how testosterone can be kind of ripped to make those estrogens, but uh, or is the cobalt just really slow in the hepatic pathways? You know, I'm not sure about all of the benefits of cobalt, but I do know that it slows down the liver's metabolism and conjugation and excretion of hormones. Mm. So the dose is generally like, you know, one milligram, even 600 micrograms. I've seen studies that support even six milligrams is okay. But, you know, with any mineral, you want to be careful with taking too much of it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So the DHEA, I, I was not aware of that. It's linked with uh, autoimmunity and so forth and helping to kind of restore that. So for women that have the symptoms of perimenopause and, and so forth, premenopausal-like symptoms, you would recommend DHEA kind of also if they have autoimmunity coexisting? And then maybe let's talk about dosing for that. Yes. So if you have plenty of estrogen on board, you can take DHEA without a problem. But DHEA is in the same family as testosterone. So if you have very little estrogen and you add DHEA in, then you'll have hair growth on the face and acne and be very frustrated. So you'll get great physiologic effects, but you'll look like a teenage boy. 
So you have to be very careful with DHEA. And an important thing too is that in Canada, DHEA, you can't get over the counter and even doctors can't prescribe it. And so DHEA, it's a hormone and you can get it in a grocery store. And so, but interestingly, in uh, the FDA actually did a study on DHEA. They took 15 DHEA supplements off the counter, measured them, and 75% of them did not have in the capsule or tablet what was listed on the label. Some had 0%, some had up to 150%. And this comes on the heels, too, of the recent study that came out with products at GNC, I think at Walmart, Target even, and what they found was that a lot of the products that were carried, the botanicals, were like houseplant remnants. <laughs> you, of all people, know that supplement companies are, you know, you can have great supplement companies and you can have very poor quality supplements. So when you're using something like hormones, like DHEA or pregnenolone that you can get over the counter, even progesterone, you have to use a very reputable source to know that it's actually you know, that it, that's working and that it's going to be a responsible amount within the capsule. So for women, if they're taking estrogen or they're premenopausal, DHEA goes anywhere from five milligrams to 25 milligrams, but I'd say pretty standard 12.5. With men, I'd say anywhere from 25 to 50. But the one thing is that there's two enzymes that are important. So the aromatase enzyme in men and women is if you carry a lot of adipose tissue, you have a lot of aromatase enzyme activity. And so with women, aromatase can make more dangerous estrogens. And for men, aromatase can take all their own testosterone and convert it into estrogen. So in men, there's this cardinal rule that if you take any DHEA or testosterone, you have to take an aromatase inhibitor with that to avoid making lots of estrogen. Mm. So, um, the other, the other important enzyme is the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. And I call this kind of the, the Andre Agassi enzyme. So guys who have bald heads, who have lots of hair on their bodies, they have a lot of 5-alpha reductase. So anytime they take DHEA or testosterone, they're going to convert that straight into dihydrotestosterone. So usually men you know, who do have really hairy bodies, they have a lot of testosterone. And so that's why the hair falls out on the head. And with women... If you take DHEA or testosterone and you have a really active 5-alpha reductase enzyme activity, you may have hair loss from those things and you can have hair growth on the face and acne. So you can't, with hormones, you can't just read a magazine or read a book and decide, watch a podcast and decide you're going to take something. So you should really get someone to help you because you can cause damage that you are very unhappy with, like hair loss. It's hard to grow that hair back. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's really good points there and caveats. And I would love to talk a little bit more about testing, but something, a couple of questions came up in my head while you were speaking there, Dr. Ellis, and that's seven keto DHA. What are your thoughts there? Because I get this question a lot, like, Mike, is this work? And is this the same? And my answer is like, well, DHEA is DHA and seven keto DHA is seven keto DHA. They're not the same. So what you want to share some feedback on, on what folks should know about that? You know, Dr. Wright, it's, I have all these Dr. Wright quotes in my head right over the years. Um, and, you know, he calls seven keto DHA a space alien molecule. So, and I like to use this example. So a couple of years ago, you know, they said vitamin E is bad. Vitamin E causes heart disease. But what they were looking at was they said, okay, most, most vitamin E is are, are vitamin E is D-L-alpha tocopherol. So instead of taking a whole mixed tocopherol that has alpha, beta, delta, gamma, they take out that one subfraction and it doesn't work the same. So you need the whole molecule. So with 7-keto DHEA, the biggest selling point of that is it's not going to convert to estrogen. And so people will take that. But when I do 24-hour urine testing, which looks at bioidentical hormones only, so if I took Premarin, it wouldn't measure on a 24-hour on a hormone test. When you take 7-keto DHEA, there's not a mention of that in the blood work or in the, in the urine test. So I just worry about, one, taking a subunit, and two, if I'm taking it and I'm doing a 24-hour urine test that looks at DHEA and its metabolites, and there's no evidence of that, and I'm always concerned about that. Yeah, like where is it going? Clinically, people like it. And, you know, Life Extension Magazine has talked about it. And so, I mean, not everyone's anti-7-keto, but just me from a standpoint of, you know, looking at those, the big picture, I don't think it's a good idea. 
Yeah. Yeah, very well said. Awesome. Uh, okay, so net, you hit on two enzymes, aromatase and 5-alpha reductase, and, and talked about why they're, you know, what their roles are and why they can be bad and so forth. Then uh, we know there's like pharmaceutical compounds like Propecia and so forth for the 5-alpha reductase. And uh, I, don't, I don't know the pharmaceuticals for the aromatase. Maybe hit on some of the drugs and then maybe natural products, because I think Dr. Wright has one you've experienced, have experience with this, natural ways to slow down these enzymes. Because a lot of men, you know, I myself, I'm starting to lose my hair and a lot of my guy friends are and we want to know like what to do about this without having to take these things and for the ladies too I see a lot of women at my gym or you know when I'm out in the grocery store that are starting to, to lose hair and it's that that estrogen or I'm sorry androgen driven hair loss so what yeah, do we do here five alpha reductase so you know sometimes men will come in and they'll say my hair is falling out you know I, I need help with this and so there's a couple different ways around it. So you can try to saturate the receptors of the scalp. Um, and Terry Hertog, who is an endocrinologist from Belgium, four generations of endocrinologists, he has a hair formula that actually has spironolactone in it. It has estradiol in it. So basically you're trying to block those testosterone receptors, the DHT receptors. If you go to Costco, you know, you can get, you know, the, the Rogaine. So what Rogaine is, whether it's for males or females, it's a blocker of 5-alpha reductase. But the most important thing to know about using Propecia, which is an oral dose, Anastrozole, you know, basically, well, Anastrozole is actually working on the other point, but um, anything that's blocking your 5-alpha reductase is also going to block your good testosterone. And so you might keep your hair, but you might lose some of your sexual function. So as soon as you explain that physiology to men, they're like, oh, you know, maybe I don't want to do that. So there are some natural reducers of 5-alpha reductase. So one is a big one, salt palmetto. It's the one that we all think of the most. And zinc and boron. Those are all reducers of the 5-alpha reductase. But you know, you don't want to suppress that completely because the prostate gland does not like that. And so 320 milligrams of, of salt palmetto is generally too much. So maybe 160 might be better with the zinc, usually 30 milligrams, boron about three milligrams. And if you are using something like Rogaine, even Rogaine used once a day completely suppresses the 5-alpha reductase enzymes. So it's good to do that urine test because you can see what your 5-alpha reductase activity is. Mm. Um, and then with the aromatase enzymes, you know, that's when you're getting into things that a lot of these things are, you're using sort of off-label uses for that. And so a lot of those things are used if someone has prostate cancer. You want to basically block any sort of estrogen or testosterone. You're, you're limiting aromatase enzyme activity so you're not feeding a prostate cancer. But in smaller doses, so the typical daily dose of something like Arimidex, for example, example an astrazole, is one milligram a day in an oral tablet. But if I want to give some estrogen blocking activity, but I don't want to suppress it completely because, again, the prostate likes some estrogen as well, and you don't want to block estrogen completely, is that I'll use even a half or a quarter milligram of an aromatase pharmaceutical twice a week. And that alone is enough to block the estrogen to a certain extent, but not completely. And then there's also, um, there's a product called Myomin. And Myomin is four different herbs, and this is used as an aromatase inhibitor. I haven't found this to be as effective as I, was like, as I would like. Mm -hmm. And Chrysin, Chrysin is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And chrysin doesn't work as well either. But I think chrysin orally or sublingually works better than chrysin in a cream form. So everyone's different, yeah. but really combinations of things are the best. The yeah. best. That's great. So uh, boron, saw palmetto, and I, I lost the other one in there, zinc? Uh, zinc, yep. Boron, zinc, saw palmetto. Great. And and doses on those guys, on the zinc and the boron? Uh, three milligrams on the boron and usually 30 milligrams on the zinc. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. That's really good information. Um, I've tried the um, uh, minoxidil, the Rogaine myself, and it, it leaves this like goo on your head. It's like this uh, film of some sort. There's some sort of glycerol in there. So to yeah. me, I think that's like starving the skin. I, I didn't find any benefits there, but I'll, I'll check out the uh, the boron and saw palmetto and zinc. That sounds like a, a good yeah. protocol. And actually, if you called University Compounding in San Diego, you could ask them about Terry Hertog's formula. And then there's a pharmacist downstairs from my office called Compounding Solutions. And she's using, for women, a spironolactone estradiol topical formula. And it's been working. So it's impressive. Mm -hmm. So that's just for women. Because would men want to put topical estrogen on their head or no? You know, I do believe Terry Hertog's formula has a small amount of estradiol in it. Okay. So I, I, don't quote me, but I believe there is. Sure. Yeah. People have to, to be on the lookout for that one. That's, this is really great information, Dr. Ellis. I love where this is going. So uh, before we talk about testing and kind of finish up, you have a lecture coming up and you're going to talk about some of the endocrine or environmental effects on the endocrine system. So talk to us about common things we should be aware of. And we've kind of hit on some of the basics, you know, in past episodes and pesticides and pollutants and stuff, but uh, any advanced tests, any you know novel things that you found to be most detrimental to the hormonal system? Well, I mean, I think, you know, in, I think we all know plastics are very bad for us. And actually, there's a really great book by a woman named um, D. Lindsay Berkson called Hormone Deception. And, you know, back in 1960, Rachel Carson started jumping up and down saying, "Hello, oh, you know, things are happening environmentally and we're not doing a darn thing about it. So really, uh, Lindsay Berkson starts looking into alkylphenols, which are in detergents. So it really does help to use environmentally friendly detergents, dishwashing detergent, clothes washing detergent, staying away from things like, you know, dryer sheets. Um, also, it's been, it's been surmised that women have a higher autoimmune incidence because of all the crap we put on our bodies. So, you know, the shampoos, think about our skin being a ginormous mucous membrane. So years ago, we were putting lead in makeup. And then the EPA or FDA said, oh, you can't do that anymore. So then they started substituting in cadmium because they weren't testing for that, which cadmium is even worse than lead. So we have to be careful with, you know, our bronzers and our, you know, mascaras and our lipsticks and all those things are really dangerous for us. And when it comes to lotions, a lot of the lotions are full of horrible things. So there's actually a website, environmentalworkinggroup.org, ewg.org, and they have a, a link embedded in there called Skin Deep. And you can type in all your products and see whether they have known carcinogens in them or not. So I would highly recommend that you do that. Um, don't microwave things in plastic. Don't put hot foods in plastic. Don't send, you know, don't buy Costco bag of frozen vegetables and boil it with ease in the plastic bag. So plastics are very, very bad for us. Um, you know, of course, the DEETs, the DDT, all of the, you know, sprays. And then should we talk about Monsanto? Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so everyone's, everyone's gluten sensitive these days, right? And so now the big question is, it's a fad. Everyone's gluten sensitive. So the most recent literature is saying, wow, actually, it's probably because we're spraying all the wheat with Roundup. And Roundup is full of, I think it's glyphosate. Um, and so is it that we're reacting to the pesticide or is it that we're reacting to the wheat? And really, you know, this whole celiac business didn't occur until, you know, it was one in 250, probably 10 years ago, and now it's one in 77. So the rates are climbing, the autism rates are climbing. I think it was a Harvard researcher recently said by 2025, then half the kids born are going to have autism. So we're now looking at environmental effects of all of the things that we're pouring into the environment without even thinking about the long-term effects. So as much as you can do with using ladybugs instead of using Roundup. Um, you know, avoid putting stuff in your yard that you wouldn't want to be breathing. Avoid buying your kids, you know, ring pops, all of these things. I'm amazed that we, we are so, our government is so against and really trying to be critical of 
herbal supplements and nutrients when they serve food, food, you know, now they're saying cheese. What did you see the study recently about like a uh, craft cheese, craft cheese and how it's really good for us, but there's nothing food about it. And so <laughs> real food and have to avoid chemicals as much as we can because they're impacting our endocrine systems, our immune systems, our genetics, you know, we're having, you know, expression of genes that normally might be silenced because of all the different environmental assaults on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really great information there. And one thing that I found interesting and wasn't really aware of it and how prevalent the flame retardants are in our furniture and household products and how those then collect in household dust. And that's one of the highest concentrations of some of these compounds, the plastics and pesticides, DDT and so forth. So what do you recommend for patients? Like uh, where do they sh like, do you get into where they should shop and furniture they should buy and where farmers markets, like what would a typical dialogue look like with a, a patient of yours that has maybe autoimmunity and hormone imbalances? You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we don't normally think to talk to our patients about those things, but you know, with children, you know, our kids are being put in these pajamas, you know, that are flame returns for sleeping on mattresses. So usually we don't even get to those conversations unless people are provoking those because people become so overwhelmed and then they do nothing. And so, you know, eating at farmer's markets is critical. Eating closer to home, is critical. So if you can shop at a farmer's market or even Hagen's grocery store, I know one of my patients has a number of huge greenhouses in Bellingham and they, he sells to Hagen's. So you're now seeing that you go into the grocery store and you can see the local section and the organic section. So doing that as much as you can. And, you know, when it comes to clothing, I mean, if you can shop at environmentally, you know, organic cotton stores, that's great. But it's not feasible for a lot of us, uh, for a lot of patients. And so, you know, you just do the best you can. It's what I tell patients. We can't possibly avoid everything. So as long as you're eating, drinking clean water, which maybe having a water filter is a really important consideration. And then, you know, eating close to home, eating whole foods as much as you can and eating organic if you can. But the economy isn't great and people are strapped for money. And unfortunately, the cheap food is the bad food. And so you just have to choose your dirty dozen and try to stay away from the things that have the highest pesticides on them. Mm -hmm. Or to Google, you know, what are the dirty dozen? Just try to print that on your fridge and try to avoid those foods that are not organic. Yeah, great point. And I'm glad you highlighted on the furniture or uh, the clothing. That's something that uh, I sometimes forget about. And we have a you know three-year-old daughter and, you know, we don't want to spend a bunch of money on clothes because she wears them once or twice and then outgrows them and so forth. So do you recommend to wash clothes beforehand in hot water? Like how can we get rid of some of these chemicals in our clothes? I have a 10 year old, we come home with new clothes and she wants to put them on right away. So I always wash them right away. I think that's very important. And the other thing is buy used clothes. So if you have a piece of clothing that's been washed 50 times before you even get it, it's going to be a lot friendlier to you chemically than something that's brand new. Mm -hmm. um, I do recommend shopping. You know, shop at Goodwill. Shop at, you know, it's amazing what you can find in those places. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome info. So anything you want to finish up with on the testing and things we should know about, whether we're, you know, patients or clinicians in terms of 24-hour urine testing and why that's superior to maybe whole blood? So blood testing is protein bound. So it correlates pretty well. You know, if your free, free hormone fraction is mid range, then your blood might be too. But in the blood, you're limited to estradiol in most circumstances. And in the urine, you can get eight different metabolites of estrogen and how we metabolize our hormones is really important to our long-term safety. So women who exercise have much better hormone metabolites than women who don't. And so that's one thing that you would never see on a blood test, like the 5 alpha inductase. You know, you would never see the um, aromatase. And, and aromatase, you're not measuring the enzyme, but for example, if a man was taking pregnenolone, like I mentioned, and his estrone was through the roof, you know that he's aromatizing. The other thing too is that when you have a man who's taking testosterone, you can do a blood estradiol. But in the 24-hour year, and you're going to get the estrone fraction. So the, the body aromatizes testosterone mostly to estrone, not estradiol. So you get a lot more information, and you get the adrenal function too. 
So we live in a stressful environment. So measuring cortisol, measuring cortisol, measuring your DHEA and the metabolites of those things is really important. And if someone's taking hormone replacement, I at least recommend doing the urine test once because it, it gives you that information about metabolites. And then later you can do blood tests, but urine testing is very important for that. I'm a big fan of thyroid testing in the blood. I'm a big fan of stool testing, you know, for any GI things. But for hormones, I am still a fan of urine testing. Salivary testing, I'm warming up to a little bit. But generally speaking, if you're taking hormones and you do salivary tests, you're going to get super physiologic levels on the, on the test results. So I'm still working through that one. Mm-hmm. Great. Now, what about for folks that just want optimal health? You know, maybe they're not on hormones yet, but they want to kind of see where they're at. You mentioned women that exercise. A lot of our folks are, are into exercise and CrossFit and weightlifting and so forth. Would once a year, you know, we recommend blood work and so forth once a year. Would you recommend doing a 24-hour urine test just to kind of see where things are at? No. I mean, it's, you know, it's a $350 test. And so it's not feasible for many people. So usually once the early testing, I want to see a CBC, which is red and white blood cell counts. It lets you know how fat your red blood cells are. I think a cholesterol panel is really important. And then just basically a comprehensive metabolic panel. What's your fasting glucose? What's your kidney function? What's your liver function? You can tell a lot just from that information. I think vitamin D testing is important, even though insurance is not testing, insurance doesn't want to pay. Um, But you can, if you have a vitamin D level of 30, to have good bone protection and good immune protection, you want it between 50 and 80. So a sort of standard calculation is for every 1,000 units, it's going to improve your level by about 10 points. Wow. So if, you're, you know, if your triglycerides are really low, like 50 or so, usually you need 5,000 of vitamin D. If you have no absorption issues, you may need two or 3,000. So I'm, and it's funny as, as far as you asked, like, what about general health? I'm a self-admitted terrible supplement taker. <laughs> yeah. But vitamin D is the one thing. If I had one nutrient that I wanted to take, it would be that. That's the most important nutrient for me, for immune system, for seasonal affective disorder, for bone density, for depression. Really important nutrient, especially in the Northwest. Mm. Uh, so I think that, you know, for someone who's not a good supplement taker, um, I think eating clean is critical, eating mostly proteins, fruits, and vegetables with very few simple carbohydrates. Um, You know, better carbs would be squash and lentils and beans and whole foods, staying away from anything in the package, and then getting good sleep. I mean, I think good sleep is, is the most important thing for our health, for our immune system, for our mental health. A lot of people in anxiety, if they just got more sleep, they would have less anxiety. And then the other thing is ex- exercise. And it's the hardest thing to do, but it's the thing that makes the biggest difference. Mood, sleep, cholesterol, most of the top 10 illnesses could be improved with regular exercise. And you don't have to go be on the Stairmaster for 45 minutes, but just walking 30 minutes a day. I mean, it, it just depends. That's not enough for many people, but for the average person, if they just got out and walked 30 minutes a day, they would feel exponentially better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really agree with that. And what I like to share with people is progress is the best motivator. You know, once you have a little bit of progress, whether it's reducing autoimmunity, improving your cognition, uh, having more energy, losing belly fat, whatever, it's going to motivate you to make better, better lifestyle choices. So um, fantastic information there. And the next question, Dr. Ellis, was going to be, what is that one nutrient herb or botanical that you just couldn't live without? So uh, we're going to say vitamin D. Is that what we're going with? That's what I'm going with for sure. Yeah. That. Great. So two final questions. And uh, if you were to rub shoulders with a congressman or Barack Obama in an elevator and they turned to you and said, Dr. Ellis is a healthcare practitioner, what lifestyle or health tip would you like me to share with Americans and why? What would you tell them? You know, it would probably be the exercise component. I mean, we have a huge obesity problem in the U.S. and we're cutting recesses, we're cutting exercise programs in school. And if people just move their bodies more, we would have such a reduced amount of illness in our in our healthcare system. Mm-hmm. So I'd probably say exercise. But again, it's the hardest thing to get people to do. Yeah. There's a great quote. I can't remember who said it, but it said. Um, those who have no time for exercise will have to make 
you know, make space for bodily illness later or something like that. Basically saying, if you don't exercise, you know, you don't have time for it. You better make time for being sick because it will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Really agree with that. Fantastic. Well, this has been very informative, Dr. Ellis. I'm sure our listeners are going to want to connect with you and so forth. So what are the best resources online that we can learn more about your practice in your clinic and some of the things that you're doing in the future? So social media is something that I've never been really great at. Um, so we have a website, TahomaClinicNorthSeattle.com. And then I have a pending uh, website, which the domain name is there, but the content's being built right now, DrWendyEllis.com. And then we have a Tahoma Clinic North Seattle Facebook page as well. Awesome. So probably our, probably our clinic address, Tahoma Clinic North Seattle, or if you just Google Wendy Ellis MD, it's, it'll have links to all of those things. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I know a lot of you listening right now are walking your dog or driving or at the gym or something like that. So I'll put all those links in the show notes and uh, we take great notes here at High Intensity Health. So that will be posted at highintensityhealth.com slash DR Ellis. So Dr. Ellis, thanks again for joining us and sharing your wisdom. I really enjoyed all the content and learned a lot of new stuff today. So I appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for spreading the word. The more informed patients are, the better they'll be. Absolutely.